I think that we are getting better um, and I know that we've won it all and we want it now and obviously our, our goal is to be on the podium at the Big Ten Championship. Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Flipping Out with Bridget Sloan. I am your host, Bridget Sloan, and this is a podcast where you will be hearing from the amazing guests that I have lined up, whether that is an athlete, a coach, a fellow ESPN analyst, or really anybody who wants to come on this platform and share their story. That story can be anything from the success, the failure, and everything in between. And today's guest, she is the head coach of Penn State Women's Gymnastics. Please give it up for Miss Sarah Brown. Well, Sarah Brown, making her guest appearance on the Flipping Out podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Well, I can assure you that I am the one honored. And I'm also very confident that all the viewers and listeners and everybody out there that they are in for a treat because you, you, my friend, are a very special lady. Um, I think everyone should know that you essentially have been on every single level in the gymnastics world. Yeah, I try. I recently became a judge, but I've only done it twice. So I don't know if you can put me on that level yet. But yeah. You're a judge? I I am a brevet judge. Can you believe that? No. Yeah, me either. Um, But it's something that I felt felt like I should try. um, And I was really grateful for the opportunity. But yeah, I, I love gymnastics. And Honestly, there hasn't been a time when I've thought about life without it. And um, I really think about it a lot, even after work. So um, I'm blessed to be able to do what I love um, and call it work. I love that. Well, that being said, so for those listening, Sarah Brown, I always want to call you Sarah Shire Brown, by the way. Like, I don't know why it is. in. It's just in my brain. And today I was like, oh, my gosh, I get to talk to Sarah Shire Brown. And I was like, she just goes by Sarah Brown now. You know what? I actually really appreciate the Sarah Shire Brown because when I got married, I took Shire as my middle name and dropped Elizabeth, which was my my parents given middle name. So I am legally Sarah Shire Brown. And I was going to go by Sarah Shire Brown until I got the job at Penn State and someone released Sarah Brown, which was fine. Oh, no. But then I just like instantly became Sarah Brown and it was like a whole identity flip. It was um, oh my gosh. something to get used to, but I will always be Sarah Shire. Always. Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, we have the same middle name. I'm a little sad that you dropped it, but that's okay. I mean, Elizabeth <laughs> might be one of the... But it's also like one of the most generic middle names. Like people get excited and they're like, oh, what's your middle name? I'm like, please don't ask me that. You're going to look at me and be like, <laughs> classic. Elizabeth, Marie, you know, mm-hmm. just one of those. Nicole. Those are all <laughs> oh, like your kind of, those are all of your kind of, you know, they're beautiful. Don't get me wrong. If mm-hmm. that is your middle Love name, them. it is a beautiful middle name. But that's so funny. I That would be very crucial to me. Like having some, oh my God, I, like I always talk about this. I feel like I will forever be like Bridget Sloan. Like, I'm like, you will. How do you drop that? How do you? And I'm like, I don't know if I could ever do that. So I think I'm just going to hyphenate when the day comes, mind you, people. Not right now. Not right now. Well, and I'm an, I'm an only child and I'm a girl. So like, I oh, my goodness. Last. Yeah. So Shire is important to me. So yeah, Sarah Shire Brown it is. You can just, we'll just edit my name on here right now. Fix that. Perfect. All right. Well, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this is Sarah Shire Brown. But one thing that you, so you are in your seventh season as a head coach at Penn State. How does that feel? It's, it's amazing. I mean, there's so many days that I look back and I still feel like I'm new and I play the new card, like with our administration and they're like, yeah, no, you're definitely not new. Um, but they're wonderful and I'm blessed to be here. Um, I can't believe what I know now that I didn't know so many years ago. Um, and I think I've come a really long way. I had been a head coach at Eastern Michigan for just shy of 10 months before I went to Penn state and I was seven months pregnant. Um, And since then, I've had two kids and bought a house and been here seven years now. So I really, I really truly feel like I've grown up at Penn State. And um, I love the team that I get to coach. And as of last year, they were all athletes that had been recruited under my leadership. So I think the dynamic is really different, but it's in a really, really healthy place um, just because these athletes have been vetted by me and my staff and kind of know what they're getting into when they show up at Penn State. Um, And I think that's obviously contributed to a lot of our success recently as well. 
I feel like I've heard that recently kind of where coaches come on and they take the head coaching position. And it's like once they kind of get their athletes that they recruited, and like you said, your staff recruited the current team, like that's a really, I don't want to say a crucial shift, but it, it it's just a cool moment. I can only imagine what that feels like as a head coach and as a staff member, like looking at your team and being like, we, like you came here for us. Yeah, we, and we chose you. I think that I always start off by saying the athletes that I inherited at Penn State were amazing. Um, All of them have touched my life and watched my family grow um, in a really unique way. And so I feel really grateful for those athletes that stayed through the transition because obviously there's so many unknowns when there's a transition with head coaches. Um, They stayed through kind of some early years in my coaching when I was still figuring out who I was and the direction I wanted the program to go. But there's something that is special with a group of athletes that you just have to look at and not say anything and they already know what you mean. Um, And I see that often when you bring athletes in, you've started recruiting them at 15 and 16 years old. And so they know your personality, they know your energy levels, they know your expectations at practice, but the same goes for them. So like when you're chatting with them on a weekly basis in the recruiting process, like you've heard them talk about a bad day, you've heard them talk about a good day, like you know when they're really excited, you know what motivates them. And so uh, we're lucky enough to bring our athletes in um, freshman summer. And I really think that that summer term has been crucial to the way that we acclimate athletes here at Penn State. Um, By the time the fall comes and campus gets really busy and they're schedules are overwhelmingly um, booked. I think we have a level of a relationship that allows us to be real with one another. And then I think that things start to happen kind of organically after that. Um, But it's just a special bond. And we remind them often when things get hard, like remember that we chose you, right? So like we knew not only that you were capable of this, um, but we picked you for this job and this is why you're excellent and this is why you belong here. Um, And then I think they in turn do the same to us. And they're like, you're right. Like I I loved Penn State in the recruiting process or I loved this coaching staff when I chatted with them. Um, Whatever each athlete's reason is, I think it feels really connected and special for them um, when they've known us for years before they get here. Oh, that's so... Mm makes my heart happy. It just makes my, it puts a smile on my face knowing the culture that you have and your staff have created at Penn State. It is just, I mean, the joy that you see on your athletes' faces, like, I think from an outsider, you're probably like, oh my gosh, look at these ladies having fun. But as a former athlete, you're like, wow, that is it, and that's not something that you can just teach. Like the athletes, they're not being told how to feel. They're not being told how to, you know, how to cheer, how to do all those things. So you and your your staff, your whole team have really just like shifted in this beautiful way of creating just an amazing culture. So I applaud Thank you, you for that. Well, I really appreciate it. And honestly, like, I don't think we talk about how hard it is. Like college is hard and like college yes. gymnastics is hard. And you compete. I mean, we're tired, right? We're at the end of season and you're not allowed to be tired. It's postseason. Right. Like, you're supposed to be excited. Like even my husband was like, aren't you supposed to be like, like excited? And I'm like, no, 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 don't get me wrong. Please don't confuse my like sleepiness with my excitement for the 18th travel weekend in a row. Oh, I can't my. wait. Um, no, but it's, it's really hard. And like, if it's going to be hard, why not do it with people that know you? Why not do it with people that love you or understand you or see you or hear you? Right. So I think if you can vet through a lot of that early on, um, it's that like, it's so old, but you know, the people don't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care, you know, slogan. And I really think that if you're going to be in the trenches with somebody, at least you're going to be in it with people that care a lot about you. Oh, gosh, I've never heard a more truer statement. If you're going to be in the trenches, you might as well like the people around you because, man, it's rough out there. It is rough out there. (laughs) It's week 12, people. Oh, my gosh. It is week 12. But I do want to talk a little bit about your before coaching life because you, man, again, Miss Sarah Brown, Sarah Shire Brown, how dare I? You have worn many hats in life, I feel like, and you have lived many lives, which is something very cool. And it's something very unique when you were in college, what you did. And that was you transferred, which nowadays, nowadays people would be like, okay, whoop-de-doo. But for you, you started at Utah, realized it wasn't the right place for you, and you transferred. 
walk me and kind of tell us about that story and how you made that decision. Because that was, I feel like that that's a really big thing to do at a very young age. No, I appreciate that. I think back often because I get to work with people that are 18 years old um, and I see the struggle and I see the look on their face when they're like, I genuinely don't know what to do. Right. And we, we put that we put a lot of pressure on young people to make big decisions early on. Um, so I was an elite um, at Gage for five years. Um, and before there were recruiting rules, right, we were all getting contacted freshman and sophomore year of high school. It actually got worse after I got recruited. So I think our class was like, we had just started sophomore year, um, when we started getting recruiting calls, um, and letters and, and questionnaires and such. And then I think like five years later, people were contacting like sixth and seventh graders. So I wasn't like in that era of oh, recruiting. Is that you? I got contacted at age 10. I had absolutely no idea what was happening and a college reached out to, like they sent a letter to my parents and my mom, I just remember my mom was like, oh dear. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to go outside now. See ya. Right. <laughs> right. And like, that's the thing, right? So I had been like, I'd been an international elite, right? And like, you get fan mail at the gym and like, you, you recognize you're good. You're obviously on Team USA and you're competing at a high level, but this idea of college was something that I was really excited about. And I think it's what everybody says. Like, it's a team sport. There's so much energy. There's so much positivity. And arrogantly, I just wanted to compete in front of a big crowd. Like, I really was like, pick Utah because 10,000 plus people so invested in gymnastics. And I just thought it was beautiful there. Um, I really had a good experience. But at the end of my freshman year, it just wasn't the right fit um, for myself or the coaching staff. And you get put in a position where, you don't quite understand going into it. I was actually thinking about this before talking with you today. I don't think I ever intentionally set out to, you know, not be as good as I should have been or not have the experience I wish I had. But you're 16 when you're making these decisions and you're 18 when you're being faced with somebody who's doing their job, right? Like now I'm in the position as a head coach and, and my job is to develop young people um, and obviously get their degrees, but there's so much more to winning and being successful and representing your program and your conference so well that they have a job to do. Um, and if I'm not a player that's going to help them achieve their job, right, then there's got to be an adjustment. Um, and so there was, and, and there was no scandal and no drama. It just wasn't a good fit. And I remember calling my dad and I said, I'm coming home. And he said, great. When are you going to be here? And I was like, oh, no, like I'm I am coming home. <laughs> like We we don't know what's next, dad. Um, and he was there a week later and and I went home. And so um, there was never really a question for me. I grew up in Missouri and my parents went to Mizzou and are Mizzou fans and alum and season ticket holders and all the things. And I they live 15 minutes from Missouri's campus now. Um, and so I went home and when I went to Missouri, I was going to be a student. And I actually got caught playing on the trampoline in the back gym with my former <laughs> teammates because I had three teammates from Gage that were at Mizzou. And so we were just like playing. Um, and that obviously prompted the conversation, right? There was no portal um, and there was no the social media wasn't what it is now. So it's not mm -hmm. like everyone heard the news that Sarah, you know, like no one heard, <laughs> no one knew like it, you know. And um, and so I had the opportunity to walk on and I walked on Missouri and competed all around my sophomore year. And um, I think probably didn't perform to my highest ability, but really just found myself and figured out who I was and realized that I really did love gymnastics and I wanted to be good at it. Um, and so I got my act together, I think junior and senior year, and we started having a lot of success, but, but I had a lot of really great teammates, um, that also had similar goals. And I really feel like we banded together and decided like we, we could be better and we could work harder. And, um, and we really did a nice job of that. And then my senior year, I was lucky enough to, um, be the first team in Missouri to advance to nationals. And at the time we were the only three seed to ever win a regional and, um, it was just a really big deal. Um, and we got to do it in my home arena. So my senior year, we hosted regionals and then we advanced beating at the time, five time reigning national champion, Georgia to go. And that was just like icing on the cake. I mean, it really was like the coolest way to end my career. Wow. Oh, gives me chills listening to that. Cause it's so important. And I hope anybody listening to this podcast, that is an athlete that is deciding on college, that is no matter where you are in life, but when you make those really big decisions, 
there's the right, like I always say, there's the right school out there for everybody. There's the right school out there for everybody. And it might not be what you thought. I know when I was choosing in college, everybody thought I was going to go to Georgia. Oh, everybody thought I was. And then I loved it. Oh, I absolutely loved it. Are you kidding? I I loved every school. I could have seen myself at every school, except unfortunately, Utah, you know why I couldn't choose you. I don't do snow. I don't do the cold. There was, it was beautiful, beautiful. Salt Lake City, beautiful, but not for me. And I truly believe that when you can go into, like you said, when you started competing at Mizzou and you found that love again, you might not have been competing to your highest level, but finding that joy is such a crucial moment and such a, it like, it almost makes me emotional thinking about it because I think back to my experience where I was super burnt out and I wasn't quite right. Re- like, I wasn't ready to call it quits on gymnastics. I go to Florida and like within probably three months, I was like, oh my gosh, I love it. And it's like finding that joy in what you do and not thinking of your sport as a job is so, it's such a, a relief. It's such a breath of fresh air to watch athletes do that. It is. And I think it's incredibly freeing for those of us who have had so much of our identity wrapped up in our sport, right? And I say this often, I used to, I wouldn't use the word embarrassed, but like people ask like when you're a gymnastics coach, they're like, oh, like, do you teach or like, like, what what are you going to, what else do you do? And I'm like, oh no, I coach division one gymnastics. And they're like, so like, what are you going to do when you're done with that? And I'm like, okay, let's Rewind, real go- big, big girl job, like lots of things happening here. I have a master's degree, thanks. You know, like I'm not trying to be arrogant, but I think that you get to this point where you feel like that identity is so of a part of who you are. And if you can get to a space where you can compete freely and love that you're competing and love yourself um, in the process, then I actually think the separation is a little bit easier. Um, yes, you have become the best version of yourself as a gymnast, But the most important part of that is that you've become the best version of yourself. And so I think that you can find yourself in that space. And I think that it's, I think it's really freeing. And I think when athletes start doing gymnastics because they love it or any sport because they love it and because they want to be better at it, that's how you start seeing gymnasts that that are doing what they're doing right now. Tens week in and week out that are legitimately doing perfect gymnastics better than I was ever doing. I mean, it's just the level of competition right now is through the roof. And I think it's obviously our developmental program and elite program is great. But what the college spaces are providing is an opportunity for this individualized growth for young women. Um, And when these women start to realize what they're capable of, I I think that that is what has driven gymnastics to the highest level um, because they're striving for perfection, not because they're being forced to, but because they can't wait to show the world that they can. And I think that's really, really cool. Oh my gosh. Yes, it is cool. And what else is cool is as a commentator, I talk a lot about these triple series and these triple elements. And I need for the world to know that Sarah not only did three, but a four element series. Um, And she's going to talk us through it because this is the most insane. I don't even know how you fit that on a beam. I know. A lot of people say that, but I'm really short. (laughs) I mean, I know that you're short, but like I watched the video. So Sarah did an acro series on beam. And if you need to write this down, you probably should because it was a handspring layout, handspring layout, which you're like, okay, what? So it, it was a double series. Yes, but it was connected like handspring layout into another handspring layout. And if you have some free time on your hands, you should definitely look it up because it is the most insane series I've ever seen in my life. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I've always loved backward series on balance beam, which is weird. Um, but, and actually, funny story. So I used to do full twisting back handspring, back handspring layout. And when I dropped back from elite, I started going back to a back handspring layout layout. And I remember that was the assignment and we had to do 10 series. This is what I was like in club, right? So we did 10 and I like going backwards and I did them fairly quickly. And I remember Armine saying, she's like, fine, do three. And I'm like, well, fine. So without warming up, I stepped up and I was like, my can't spring, lay out, lay out, lay out. And if anybody knows Armine, like I say this like in the nicest way because she and I have a very strong relationship, but she, um, she said, almost good. And I was like, almost good. That was so awesome. <laughs> like, I just did that. <laughs> and so precursor to that, um, 
I had been doing that. And then um, I had the opportunity. So Amy Smith was one of my beam coaches um, when I was in college and she's at Clemson now. And at the time she had been, she showed me videos of Stella Umine, who was a gymnast at UCLA. And Stella did a quad series. And I just remember thinking like that was a decade ago and she did four skills in a row. That's so cool. And so I had started out by trying to do, she, so Stella did back handspring, two foot whip, back handspring, layout, step out. And I thought, well, I'll do back handspring layout, step out, back handspring layout, two foot, or like a back pike, maybe. Mm -hmm. That was treacherous. (laughs) It was really dangerous because it was really wonky (laughs) in the middle. And a two foot landing when you're crooked is really hard. Um, And so I started playing with the handspring layout, handspring layout. And um, it took a little bit of time. Um, I remember Amy telling me that I had like a date in September. She's like, you have to have it by this date in order to train it for season. And so I really put my mind to it and trained it. And it was really hard to figure out how to do the layout step out into the backhand spring after having done the layout and then a stronger jump into the second layout. Um, But once I figured out the rhythm of it, um, I really enjoyed it. And looking back, it wasn't worth a lot. I think lay lay was worth four. And I think handspring layout, handspring layout was only worth three. Um, But it looked cool. You were super cool. It was fun. And it was fun and people liked it. And I didn't fall on it until the very last meet of my career. So for anybody that thought it wasn't consistent, it was. But I will say that my beam career ended on that stupid series. And well, I'm okay. I'm totally fine. <laughs> it's fine. I don't think about it every single day of my life. It's fine. Every, I've moved on. It's not been 20 years. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> How dare anybody say any anything about your gymnastics not being consistent. I feel like if there's one thing you can say about Sarah Brown, it's her consistency in the gym and outside of the gym. So period. Ending that. Ending that. So, okay. So you have this amazing career at the University of Missouri. Go Tigers. M-I-Z-Z-O-U. Woo. Yes, ma'am. She said it. Okay. I'm allowed to say that. And then you are a director of ops at Mm -hmm. Missouri. And then you kind of, I don't want to say you like got shoved into coaching, but your coaching career really took off that following year. So my, my biggest question is, did, did you always know you wanted to be a coach? Cause I feel, I, I do feel like a majority of coaches out there right now are like, I just knew this is what I wanted to do. Yeah. I think I I knew, I always tell people, I think I knew my junior year of college. So when we were talking about that, like sophomore year, I was still kind of like fumbling around with who I was and what I wanted to do. And then junior year, I think was the when I took my first sports psychology class in college. And I just remember thinking like, wow, like had I known this like two years ago, I might have been a lot better, you know, or when I was an elite and I had these like breathing skills or these like coping mechanisms, like I would have been a lot better of a gymnast. Um, And so I really fell in love with the sports psychology of it um, and started taking um, sports psychology classes and then was lucky enough at the time the director of ops position and a grad assistantship didn't exist. Um, And Missouri actually had an assistant coaching position open. And I was lucky enough to be taken through an interview process um, knowing pretty well that the job wasn't mine, but just as a practice opportunity for me to interview. And I got to sit in front of administrators and practice my interviewing skills as a senior in college, which was really cool. Um, and then this director of ops position became available and there was a grad assistantship attached to it. So I was able to get a master's degree in counseling psychology and an emphasis in sports psychology. Um, and I think that that was just the perfect avenue for me to find my footing um, in college gymnastics. I think I was an okay choreographer early on. It's certainly not my strong suit now. Um, And I think that often as women, we're trying to figure out, like, what do you bring to the table? And so it was really easy. Like, if you're a great choreographer, people are probably looking for choreographers. But if you're not, you probably need to be a really good spotter. And, like, I'm four foot ten and a half on a good day. So, like, by the time you get to me, like, (laughs) you are really close to the floor. Like, I am not your help. Um, the landing I, is coming by the time you get to them. Like they're already on their feet. God bless the kids who let me practice spot with them. But I just, it wasn't my thing, you know? And so I just really was trying to like find my niche and trying to figure out how to stand out. Um, and I got the opportunity to be the assistant coach at Southeast Missouri State which was really a great opportunity for me to go away from home, but not be too far. Um, It was hard after my freshman year. You know, I went all the way out to Utah and 
oh, at the time it felt like I didn't make it, right? Like I failed. And at, now I see that as just like a part of my journey. But at the time it felt like I left home and didn't do well. And so I was a little bit nervous about leaving Columbia and leaving home. And SEMA was the perfect place for me. Um, my husband's family was an hour and a half from there and my family was three hours. Um, and so I was there for three seasons. And anytime you get to be a part of a smaller institution, your hand is in everything from marketing to equipment moving to recruiting um, and developing the athletes. And so I really got to see firsthand what a college coach life could look like. Um, and then after three seasons, I just was missing something and I, I wasn't really sure what that was. And I felt like I wanted to be a part of a larger institution. And um, I had joined all of our committees and been a member of our coaches association as the secretary. So I had the pleasure of sitting up front in front of all hundred and however many coaches um, and seeing everybody and kind of let it be known that I was looking to do something else. And I'll never forget Bev Plocky approached me. And I remember her saying, she's like, well, I have a volunteer position open. I'm like, that's great. I have a full time job. Like, <laughs> I don't know what you're doing for you. That doesn't make any money. <laughs> um, and the more I thought about it, the more I just felt like that had to be the route to go. And I think that you've seen that a lot in college gymnastics now. Now we have the fourth coach, but up until this last year, we didn't. Um, and so a lot of us volunteered. And so I told my husband, and that that is exactly how that happened. I told my husband. I was moving to Michigan. You have no choice. And, yes, <laughs> three kids, thank God. But I was just like, hey, I've got to do this and I've got to explore this and see what happens. And so I moved to Michigan by myself um, and until he could find a job there and became the volunteer coach um, and just just fully immersed myself in in all things, you know, gymnastics and college gymnastics. I was a GK rep in order to make a little bit of money. So I made some leotards for some people in Michigan. Shout out to my Michigan Love clients. It. Love um, it. And then I coached club because that was what I did. So I was um, with Bev in the office from like nine to maybe like four-ish um, after practice. And then when practice ended, ran over to the club gym and coached club from five to nine. Um, and we did that for a whole year um, until I got the opportunity to be the head coach at Eastern Michigan. But I, I mean, it was I was young and it was a hustle and it was a grind and we didn't have kids and it was the only way I knew to keep moving forward. And so I'm super grateful. Um, it worked out really well for me. Like I said, um, became the head coach at Eastern Michigan and honestly had one of the best experiences there that I could have asked for. Um, it's such an amazing program and the MAC conference is so competitive. Um, all of those athletes are super gritty and hardworking and in it for all the right reasons. And um, felt really supported by the administration there, made a lot of good things happen. And um, that team was ultimately regular season and postseason MAC champions. They were great. Um, and then I got pregnant and thought, well, we'll just stay in Michigan. This is working out really well. And Penn State called. Um, and I just remember being a little bit blindsided by the whole process and thinking this is a lot bigger than me. And again, keeping my interview skills sharp, this would be a really great chance um, to interview. And I did. And then and then I got the job. And here we are. It was just it was wild. It was really, really crazy um, and a whirlwind. But it was the right time. Um, and looking back, I don't think any other time I would have said yes. But that was the time that we just jumped in with both feet. And my husband is he's everything. Um, and he has helped me so much in making that transition and raising our boys and being around when I'm not. So um, right now it's working out really well for us. Wow. That's a roller coaster. I feel like you That's just my literally, story. literally took us on a roller coaster, but what an amazing ride. And just how cool to be able to acknowledge. I think there was definitely, in my opinion, and again, this is my podcast. I can have my opinions, but the volunteer assistant position always, to me, it always seemed crazy because it's like, how do you make money? Because, I mean, let's be honest, in order to live, you must make a little bit of an income. And to know that that position was going to take you to the next level, whether you might have known it at that time or not, that to me is the biggest sign of growth. It's the biggest sign of like dedication. And you deserve a pat on the back for that because that is a huge life-changing moment for you that you were just like, hey, I'm going to quit my full-time job and I'm going to move to Michigan. 
Do you just like, like, do you just enjoy the cold? Is that what I'm understanding? You just don't like warm Absolutely. weather? Yes. I, I, no. You know what, Bridget? If we are talking reality, we provide amazing coats and hats and gloves. And it is not about the weather. It is about what you wear in it. That is my Fair. recruiting pitch for the cold weather. <laughs> Honestly, I used to get so jealous because obviously at Florida, we did not get coats or we like, you know, we would have our little dinky Are you coats. really mad? That's what you didn't get. A coat. I mean, they look really cool. Okay. Not that I would have really worn them, but they look, I was more so jealous <laughs> that they had them like in the arenas because those arenas would get I know. cold. Yes. And we're yes. over there in our little sparkly shirts and our, you know, high socks. And I'm like, wow, it'd be great if I had you a did jacket. wear high socks. We, you know what? We were all wearing them back then. We wore our biker shorts low enough to see our hip bones, our leotards. Over our hip. Somebody find a picture. It's out there. I the know for a fact. I, mm -hmm, I know for a fact I there are photos floating out there. I wore, you know, whoever told me I look good lies. You lied to my face. So we all looked good. And I remember from my senior year, we put puffy paint. Like we signed each other's socks in puffy paint. And that was like one of our team bonding activities. And then our meat socks were signed by each other in puffy paint. For those listening, puffy paint? That is... Circa 2010. Wow. Oh, that is <laughs> dedication. Honestly, maybe yes. we... You know what, ladies? Let's bring it back. Let's bring the puffy paint back. The high socks, the low... Gosh, the low shorts. I was atrocious our girls today it's all about right like the high waist and like you can even see it when athletes wear their bikers like a little like their tight shorts like even higher above their belly buttons and i just remember like rolling mine as low, low as, as you can go, go right horrible crank that leotard up horrible <laughs> horrible oh my gosh to be honest though nowadays you you could not pay me enough to wear a pair of low-rise jeans i i will never never do it again you know it's so funny watching the trends change, right? Because I think that we were all at some point self-conscious about something. Oh, yeah. And then as like the trend changes in, you know, what's cool in your body type or what's mm -hmm. an acceptable clothing piece or whatever, um, I look back and I'm just like, wow, had that been cool when I was in college, I would have had the coolest outfit ever, right? Or like, I would have looked, you know, amazing. Or I would have looked really good wearing that outfit, you know? So, but my goodness, what we were wearing in that time, it was just oh, I know. different than now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Moving it's been on. a journey. Moving on. Okay. Yeah. It's it's called growth here, people. It's about evolving, not just as an athlete, but also your fashion. And I think you and I both did a very good job of evolving and we let it go. Mm -hmm. I mean, I even wear I I wear my hair in the middle part. You're I, very cool. The rocking this <laughs> side part. But I do I did figure out how to curl. I stopped doing the flat iron bone mm -hmm. straight thing that we were all killing our hair with. I'm not, good at, I'm not good at curling my hair yet. I haven't. My, mm, I'm a claw clip girl. I wear my hair in a claw clip every day. I do like those. I mean, I just can't be bothered these days. I'm like, I get up and I get ready for work and I'm like, yep, claw clip. Here we go. Oh, gosh. Fashion trends. Did you guys know that this podcast was all about the fashion trends? <laughs> Little did you know. <laughs> Be careful. They'll come after my meat outfits, man. Sometimes it's hard to come up with a lot of meat clothes. And yes, I do okay. wear heels, but sometimes my feet get tired. Okay. Anybody who ever comes for any coach in their meat attire, stay in your lane. I feel very good about, I, I don't care what you wear. I, I remember, which it's funny now I can say this, Jenny used to rock the highest heels during season and she had her shoe closet goals goals and now i'm like jenny you are so relaxed she's like yeah i just can't do it anymore and i'm like i hear you like but I she's also very cool relaxed this is not always relaxed like her jackets and mm -hmm. blinged out tennis shoes jenny will always have cool girl fashion which jenny i 100%. hope you i hope you're listening because she will always have cool girl fashion because she has two daughters who also have cool girl fashion and it's just you know they they help her out they help her out but no anybody who comes for your meat outfits be gone be gone stay in your lane don't no. It's bad enough we talk about the leotards, right? And yeah, why are we talking? Coaches' attire. Exactly. There's a lot happening with the leotards. 
Really? Oh, is there some drama? Well, you know, no drama, but everyone can't wait oh. for the new rankings to come out. And everybody's opinion is so different. And it just makes oh. me laugh. I'm like, I love that our sport has gotten to the point where like the gym internet is a real thing. And I love that. I mean, it, here's the deal. If we want to be taken seriously, we have to be open to people critiquing every aspect of what it is we do. And if leotards are getting likes on Twitter, then let's keep going. So, I will say the leotard game. Wow. It has oh, wow. really up. Are you calling it the chandelier disco game? Because right now we are in the race for the shiniest leotard, I think, out there. I kind of the love out. it. I love I'm it. I'm obsessed. I love My only question, it. how do the girls wear it? Like, do they wear sports bras? Because we used to have I like will. the, the, it had like a clear strap in the back. And I absolutely did not love those because um, I had to wear like two or three because, well, yep. Anyway, so I hated those. And now I see all these backless leotards. So, our oh. leotards, and I can only speak for Penn State, um, but our leotards have built-in bras. No way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I'm with wow. you. Like, I want the unique back. I love right. a good open back. I love for a unique sure. back. Um, and, and, some, and the clear straps are still out there, and people wear them, and that's also fine. Um, but we've done built-in bras in the last three or four that we've done, maybe more than that. Um, so I obviously want the athletes to feel comfortable. I'll be honest. Some of them work really well and some of them don't. And I've learned that the good and the bad, right? In the hard way too. But for me, it's a lot about what our athletes feel comfortable in. And I'm a huge believer in us being, if we like feel beautiful, right? I think I know that's cliche, but I do think you feel good. You compete well. Um, and so I love when our girls love our leotards and I love debuting a new one. And I, oh, love, I love that they're that. excited to wear them. Yeah. Yes. Okay. First of all, Especially, I have two boys. You need that. So Jenny's got her girls to help her, but I've got two boys, so I got to get one. That is true. That is true. You need it. And also, that is not a cliche because when you look good and you feel good, yes. you are good. True. Like, it's true. The power of a good outfit. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I get, I get more excited about like when I have packages coming to the house. Oh my God. I open them immediately. And what I put this podcast about life. This podcast is about life and all things <laughs> living gymnastics. life with Bridget Elizabeth. Exactly. And this is also, I mean, this is about gymnastics. There's a lot in, I mean, the rhinestones alone on these leotards, if we really want to get picky, mm -hmm. uh huh, they are not cheap. These ladies are wearing beautiful leotards that i don't swarovski want. crystals oh my yes gosh. i don't even want to know how expensive that is anyway um <laughs> so we do need to talk about the current status of your team because you guys just rocked a quad me over the weekend ended up taking the w that's right the big old winner winner chicken dinner with a 196 875 and i know we talked earlier and you're like yeah we made it interesting but I mean, we're at the tail end of season. We're actually, I mean, we're gearing up for conference championships this coming weekend. How impressed were you with the fight that your team showcased over the weekend? I mean, I can't say enough about this team. And we talk often about showing up to compete for events. And, you know, we've seen, we've been the team that has had three good events and one that's not as strong or two really strong and two that were not so strong. And so the idea was to show up and compete for events. And we knew that we'd be finished early on vault. Um, and that idea, you know, that you have to leave it all out on the floor. You never want to leave your fate in somebody else's hands. Um, I thought we had a good vault rotation, but it wasn't a perfect fault rotation. And so um, we actually talked as a team that, you know, we were really satisfied with our performance. We knew that that score would help our NQS move up a little bit. But we also talked about the fact that we needed to be sharper the next week at conference, right? If we're going to have an opportunity to finish higher than we finished in the last few years, we need to be a little bit better. And so to be honest, we were focused on ourselves. Um, and in the arena, they had stopped showing the scores. And so we didn't have any idea really what was happening. And then we pulled it up on our phones in the last rotation. Uh, we found the live stat link to figure out what had happened. Um, and so we were kind of so in our bubble that we didn't realize that we had gotten the win. We had just kind of been focusing on our own score. And it's such a hard balance, right? Because you're chasing these scores because that's, that's what's going to help rank you. 
but the scores are completely in the judge's hands. And so it's a really difficult message, I think, when you're talking to your team. Like you want to focus on tangibles and you want to focus on the things that are in your control. But then when an athlete does something that is, you know, what I would consider perfect or significantly better than the week before, that's not guaranteed that our scores can be higher. In in some arenas, that doesn't always happen. And so it's a really difficult balance in finding, like, do you put stock in the performance or do you put stock in the score? Um, and so we had kind of focused on the performance and felt like we could give a little bit more. Um, and then we had the opportunity to to take the win. And I felt like the message I gave to the team after that was, listen, everybody had to compete all four events. And on this night, you were the best team in this arena and you should feel really proud um, because it was loud and it was competitive and it was down to the wire. Um, and it really could have been anybody's meet. Um, and so th- I thought it was a great opportunity to prepare going into postseason. Um, the Big Ten Championship is is so incredibly competitive and it's so hard every year. Um, and so I think we're primed for a really great showing next weekend. Oh, that's amazing. I have been saying for the last couple of years that the Big Ten has been leveling up just at a rapid pace. I mean... It, it, and I think that just goes to show the amount of talent, no matter what conference you are in, you are going to be up against very, very talented athletes every single weekend. I think that we see that in the DP program when we're at nationals and we're recruiting. I mean, there are so many more great kids out there. Um, and I think that we've all, I shouldn't speak for everyone, but it does feel to me that our rosters have gotten a little bit larger. And so there's a little bit more of an opportunity to create um, a lineup that is really exceptional. Obviously, you know, Michigan had dominated the Big Ten for years, and I think everybody was kind of gunning um, to build and build and build. And I really do think that it's anybody's game. Um, my staff and I talk all the time about how every meet in every dual meet in the Big Ten is like got to be the best meet of your life. And I think there was like four meets in a row where either we or another team had their season high against us. And it was like it just feels like everyone keeps getting better and you have to show up every single week. Um, and so I know it's prepared us for postseason. And, and as a conference, we talk often that because our conference is so competitive, I do think we show really well um, when we get to postseason. When we get to the NCAA first, second, and third rounds, the Big Ten handles itself really well because we've been in these extremely competitive environments week in and week out. Um, and it, it really makes me proud to represent the Big Ten Conference and the fact that we're going to get even bigger next year um, to have 12 teams competing in our conference. I mean, it really feels like a mega conference. Um, and we're really excited that. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. I am very, very excited for you guys for the rest of season. But I do want to know, you know, what what is your biggest takeaway this season? Every season is different. I mean, we could we could talk about the difference of teams and seasons. Every single season is different. But what is it about this team right now that just gets you excited? Yeah, I think there's a number of things. I think one, um, they work really, really hard. Like it feels good because they worked so hard in the fall. The conditioning is hard. The days are long. The building of routines is an extremely tedious process. And we do have so much competition on our roster that you really have to keep showing up and you have to keep showing out in the inner squads and in the practices and doing the numbers. And, and I see that and I I know it's grueling and I know it's hard. Um, but to see that reward when they hit in competition or they see it score. I mean, the 196, 8, 7, and 5 was the fourth highest road score in school history. Like, what does that tell you about how far we've come? This is our 60th year of gymnastics at Penn State. And to still be pushing those boundaries is incredible. Um, so I'm excited because they've put in the work and, and I feel really confident in their performances because of that. I'm excited because we're really young. Um, I talk all the time, like our beam lineup is sophomore, freshman, freshman, sophomore, most of the season. That's how we let off. Um, and in many of our lineups, it's very similar. I think right now we've got three freshmen in a row in the floor lineup to start it off. That's how much confidence we have in those underclassmen. But those underclassmen wouldn't know how to be great without the leadership of our upperclassmen. And so these seniors were our COVID seniors. They took their first college class, like, in their mom's living room because they couldn't come to campus in June of 2020. And so the the commitment from those athletes in showing the underclassmen, like, this is what we've been through and this is what we worked for. Like, we trained in pods. We wore masks. We only traveled regionally. Like, we were tested every single day for COVID, right? Like, what they had to endure was really challenging. 
And so it's just this, we're in this sweet spot right now where we have a level of work ethic and gratitude um, that just makes our team feel really special. I genuinely love every single person on the team, um, and they happen to be really good athletes as well. But my favorite part about season is just traveling with them. Um, Our parent group is unbelievable. I've never had a university charge us for extra tickets in the pass list section because we've never maxed out the pass list. And so often you get 50 complimentary tickets when you travel. And I think we had 65 people on the pass list this past weekend. And those are just parents and families and friends that are just coming to watch Penn State compete. And they're loud and they're proud and they're decked out in their striped overalls and all the things. And we have a group of dads that are called Dads with Abs and they have PSU painted across their shirts every single week. Wait a second. That is yes. a real thing. Dads with abs is a real thing. Amazing. Um, and I love it. It's amazing. Yeah. So I just, I love the people. I love the people. I love my staff. I love the people I'm around. And um, this job is really hard. And we don't talk about that a lot. Um, but if it's going to be hard, like I said, you want to be with people that you love. And that's what makes me really happy to go to work every single day. Wow. Yes. That's so great. Oh, you're such a star. You're like a super mom, super coach, super, super human. I try. Thank you. My boys <laughs> got to go with us this past weekend. And I actually oh, thanked the team. Yeah. I was just like, hey, like, thanks, guys. Like, we were late to the bus. Like, my fault. Like, our kids are six and my youngest will be four this week. And, you know, it's hard because we are gone on those Saturdays and Sundays when they're free and we're on the road with the team. And they'll ask me, you know, how's how's Nastics? And then they know the girls' names. And so how's Cass? And how's this girl? And how's that girl? And they've heard the stories and they know what the team's been through, but I, they can't quite understand exactly why mom's gone all the time. And so just to have that opportunity for them to be on road um, with us this weekend was really great. And for my team, I think to see me mom as well um, kind of gives a human level to what I do and who I am because it is, it's possible that I'm seen just as a business leader, right? And as a director of the program and I am a person and and my heart does break for you when things, when bad things happen for you. And I do have to make tough decisions, but it doesn't mean I don't care. Um, and so anytime those two worlds can merge, um, it makes my heart feel a little bit eased. Um, and so I'm really grateful they had the opportunity to come. Oh, honestly, some of my favorite moments of my gymnastics career at Florida were traveling when Rhonda's boys would get to come with us. That's really good to hear. And I, I'm, again, like without the parent support too, when they're up in the stands and my kids are like climbing all over the other moms. I, I think years ago I would have been like mortified, like, oh my God, please don't bother them. But they love it. And, you know, their daughters are competing at this high level. And like at one point they were three and four years old. And so then they get it. And like, what better people to have in your corner than people who have already done the job? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I can assure you, your athletes will remember those moments. They will. It is very, it's, it's so crazy to think back. Like, I was thinking about this when I was at, I was commentating at Florida and Rhonda was there with her two, with, I think both boys were there and they're, well, both of them are taller than me. They're, and I'm like, you will forever be five years old in my eyes. Just know that. Yeah. I'm like, you will always. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. So it, those moments that you might not think are that big as an athlete and seeing Again, it, it gives you a different perspective. And the same goes for Jenny when with her two daughters. I I always loved being able to like be around them because it is you get it you get a different perspective and you're not looking at, you know, coach Sarah. You're looking at coach Sarah who is a mom, who is a spectacular human like who is a human being. Right. That piece I think gets missed for coaches sometimes. And and unfortunately, it could probably gets missed for everybody because of the internet, right? Like, like it's really easy to sit back and place judgment, right? Or blame. And I I remember I had certain notions maybe before I became a head coach. And I remember how many social media accounts I either stopped following or what message boards I stopped looking at. Because at the end of the day, we really are doing the best that we can. And we all are are giving it everything we've got, right? And we're making, I said this earlier today too, sometimes we're making decisions with the information we had at the time. It doesn't always mean it's perfect. And it could mean that in hindsight, it could have been differently. But at the time, 
that's what I was operating with. And so I think that's what helps me sleep at night. Um, and I think that becoming a mom has made me a better coach. And I think that our parents and families can see that as well. Um, that yes, it's a business and yes, it's really hard, but I'm going to care deeply about your daughter and, and we might have to have difficult conversations, but it doesn't mean that I care any less, um, about her experience. And, um, and so I think it's nice whenever my worlds collide and that's really great. Oh, making me tear up over here. That's so true. And it's so, (laughs) it is, I mean, being a coach, I don't know what it's like. I've never been a coach, but I can imagine it's ridiculously hard and you've got a lot of eyes on you just about every moment of your life. So just know you're doing a great job. You're doing a really, oh, really you. great job. I appreciate it. And is there anything else you want the people of Flipping Out with Bridget Sloan, the podcast, to know about you or your team, especially heading into postseason? I mean, I will always take the moment to talk about my team because I think they're incredible. Uh, but I did mention that it's 60 years of gymnastics at Penn State. And so we were able to celebrate our alumni weekend. And we have a special leotard that's got a number 60 on it for the 60th year. Um, just to see how far women's sports has come um, and to see the support that we have for women's gymnastics at Penn State. Um, I just feel incredibly honored to be a part of it. Um, I think that we are getting better um, and I know that we want it all and we want it now. And obviously our our goal is to be on the podium at the Big Ten Championship. Um, The easiest way to do that is to be in the night session. And we didn't land ourselves in the night session this year. Um, But when I look at the growth of the program over the last seven years, this really is the steady rise that we continue to see. And it, it feels like you want more now because we're, we're having so much success. But, but the reality is like these steps are very methodical. Um, and I think that in the long run, the work that we're doing now is going to pay off. Um, I always like to mention my staff. So I have Ralph Rosso, Rachel Innes, and Lindsay Brown with me, which is exciting that Lindsay just finished college at Denver um, and has joined our coaching staff. And I think the four of us together are probably doing some of the best work that I've done in my career as a coach um, because we spend probably way too many hours critically thinking through every single athlete's training plan, what events make sense, what skills make sense, um, how we're going to peak them, how we're going to develop them. And just being in a space where you can really challenge your staff members and they can challenge you in a respectful way helps me to feel like I'm, I'm growing, but I don't feel like I'm fighting, right? Like I'm not pushing back. I'm simply having a really engaging conversation about one way or another way. And at the end of the day, we come out of those meetings united um, for the team, which is obviously the most important thing. But I can honestly say that every decision that we've made, we've thought through really strategically and really critically. Um, And then we've come out on the other side really unified. So Rachel, Ralph, Lindsay, I appreciate you. Um, You guys are great. And, um, And I'm really excited for the future of Penn State Gymnastics. Wow. I think everybody is excited after that speech. My goodness. I am, I mean, I'm very excited for you as a person, but I'm also extremely excited for the growth of your team, for the future success of your team. I love that you mentioned, you know, these steps. It is, it is a process. I mean, no team is good overnight. I mean, it is, it is years and I am just really, really proud of what you have. Again, you've transformed Penn State women's gymnastics into this beautiful, culturally positive, amazingness. Yeah, ness. And that, that's something that I don't think you get enough credit for. And I don't think your staff gets enough credit for. So kudos to you. Keep doing you. I am beyond excited because you have Big Ten championships this weekend. I wish you the best of luck. I mean, I wouldn't even say go out there and kick butt. Just go out there and do your normal and it will come. Got it. Will do. (laughs) Well, thank you. I'm honored. No, really, it's going to be great and I'm excited. And when it goes well, I'm going to send you a text. So I can't wait. I cannot wait. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was fun. That wraps up today's episode. I hope you all enjoyed. And please like and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. I am your host, Bridget Sloan, and this is Flipping Out with Bridget Sloan. Make sure to tune in every week where we will be dropping new episodes with the amazing guests that I have lined up for you. I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day. Let's go do something awesome. And yeah, let's have a great day, y'all. Bye, guys.